my first memories of Mickey Mantle were 1967, when Mantle hit home run number 500 of his illustrious career. I was watching on a little black and white TV as he limped around the bases with his head down like he liked to do because he was very kind of humble. He wanted to get back into the dugout. So from that moment on, I was a diehard Yankee fan for life. And that's my earliest recollection. Unfortunately, 67 was the tail end of Mickey Mantle's career. Now, we have a guest in studio that I'd like to welcome in. He's a diehard Yankee fan, just like myself, but he goes back a little further, and he goes back to the 1950s. Donald Ritter, we'd like to welcome you to the show. Thank I'm you for honored. stopping you, down. Donald, how far back you go? I know 1950s? 1953. Uh, first time I saw Mickey Mantle was at my grandma's house, grandma and grandpa's house, and we were all sitting around, and uh, it was the World Series, 1953 World Series, and um, they said, oh, the Mick is up, and they had a, a, a TV at the time, which was black and white, and it was a pentagonal uh, TV, it was about 13 inches, so this guy gets up, Mickey Mantle, and all you can see is this big back and number seven, the whole screen. So they were trying to explain to me the best four out of seven, and all I was a little kid saying, well, if we win this, do we win the championship? Do we? And, well, they said, the Mick is up, Mickey Mantle. Well, that was it. That was it. And you were hooked? I was hooked. I was really hooked. And uh, uh, I, it, he was an icon, and uh, I was just uh, overwhelmed. You, um, you probably heard my comment, but I always loved the fact how humble he was. And, like, when, you know, I think, like, all of us on the street when we would play ball, we would all emulate that little limp, the way he ran around the bases with his yes. head down. I just loved the fact that, you know, these guys today, they flip the bat and all this other nonsense. He hit the ball, Donald, 500 feet, and he put his head down, and he'd run around the bases like almost he was embarrassed. <laughs> I mean, he was a very shy individual. Okay. And uh, in those days, if you flipped a bat, or you pointed, or you did anything like that, the next time up, you were getting one off the back. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't done, and he was very humble. He always ran around the bases with his head down, mm -hmm. and uh, he was embarrassed that he was so good. Well, you know, it's a, it's a pleasure to speak to you because you go, you know, you go back further in those years, those halcyon years of the 1950s. So 53 was, um, you know, was a highlight, but 55, not so much. The unthinkable happened. Oh. The Bungs, the Brooklyn Dodgers beat us. Do you have any recollection of that? I do. I was, uh, I was coming home from school, and my school was about three blocks from my house. So I had my backpack on, and I wanted to see the end of the game because all the games were in the afternoon, all the um, right. World Series games were right. in the afternoon. So it probably started at 1, or th and I was running home. It was close to 3. And I hit the corner, and I heard someone yell out, the Dodgers won two to nothing. Well, I almost, I almost mm. fell right down. I was crying like a little baby. I was, you know, yeah. well, how old was I? Seven years old. Sure. I was in the second grade, and I got home and I had to deal with it. And uh, for years, I watched Sandy Amos's catch and Johnny Padres' two nothing shutout. And uh, eh, that's it. it was, yeah. It's, it's part of a uh, rooting for a team. Memorable game. Look at that. And iconic Yogi, picture. Iconic, iconic picture. You're so right. That's right. And Yogi leaping into his arms. Uh, you recall it? Oh, and the funny thing was, do I recall it? My brother was at the game. He was 12 years old. He had worked for the World Telegram and Sun, and uh, he got the most subscriptions. So he was brought by the supervisor of the World Telegram uh, and a couple other guys to the, um, to the Yankee game, the World Series game. And uh, he, um, he was there. Ed Sullivan was there. He got Ed Sullivan's autograph. And, and you can't see it well, but the Ed Sullivan's there, and my mom has a little note up, up in the top. He has Eddie, and it's mm -hmm. 1956, um, Don Lawson, perfect game. But my brother got the uh, most subscriptions by using me, his younger brother. And yes, he didn't take yeah. you? Well, he couldn't. It, oh, was, okay. uh, it was given to people who, were, who worked there. But uh, he had me at eight years old knocking on doors in the apartments where he delivered papers and saying, ma'am, would you like to have a subscription to the World Telegram? So I don't know how many women said, Oh, what a cute little boy. Here we go. Uh, yes. So he got the, sub I got the subscriptions. He got the tickets to the World Series game. <laughs> that's, that's what the older brother gets, right? That's it. Yeah, that's you, know, right. you know. That's yeah, right. Seniority. That's seniority. 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 What's your brother's name? Eddie. 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 Okay. Yes. yes. And um, 
You know what? Let's uh, let's fast forward if we can to uh, to 1961 uh, because um, again here you have it. I mean, look at that infield. Does that Scourin, bring back memories? Scourin, Richardson, Kubek, and Cletus Boyer. Wow. And Cleet Boyer was one of the best third basemen that's probably that ever lived. Uh, he was in Brooks Robinson's, uh, uh, you know, uh, type uh, of uh, third baseman. He was just fantastic. He used to throw people out on his knees. He would make a backhand play, stay on his knees, and he had such an arm that he would throw them out from his knees. So he, he, was, uh, he was a great, great fielder. You know, uh, Donald, just as we said that 56 washed that bad taste out of 55, 61 oh, <laughs> was obviously getting back on the horse, but in 1960... I was again, 12. I cried. Tell us about that. I cried. Well, Good I was man. sitting home watching this, and Bill Mazeroski gets up, and Bill Mazeroski was not a home run hitter. Ralph Terry was on the mound, mm -hmm. and he threw his famous curveball. And uh, Yogi Berra was playing left field at the time, mm. okay? And uh, it's an ivory wall, uh, and uh, the ball went over the wall, and Yogi Berra just l looked to go, you know, watch it go over. And, and his uh, kind of knees buckled. Yeah, a little bit. And Mickey Mantle cried after that uh, because the Yankees outscored them by 20 or 30 runs through the whole series. They won the game like 15 to 5, but they would lose the game 3 2. So, uh, but uh, Bill Mazeroski, um, uh, you know, he was a heads up, hard nosed player. and and, you know, God shined a yeah. light on him. He, had, he had his him. moment, but yeah, 61 right. to get right back on the horse. Uh, the home run production, uh, what a great uh, what a great I watched that race uh, as every game I watched mm -hmm. that I could. And uh, uh, Mickey Mantle got um, hurt near the end of that year. I think he had an infection in, in his, his, um, his hip. hip. Yeah, That's he had correct. Absence, in his yeah. hip, yes. And um, it wasn't well taken care of, and it cost him many at-bats. And Roger Maris... Um, Obviously, 61 home runs in 1961. Phil Rizzuto made the call, if you remember. Holy cow. Holy cow. <laughs> That's right. Yes. You know, it's funny because I had the gentleman that caught the ball. I had him on my no, show. No, really? You know what? He's from Staten Island. Well, originally he was from Brooklyn. Oh. When he caught, but he lives on Staten Island. His is name right? is Sal Durante. And okay. I had him in studio. And it was, uh, it was a, a great interview because he tells the story that he attempts to give the ball back to Roger Maris. Wow. And Roger says... Keep it, kid. You know, he said, you know, you maybe yeah. one day you'll get a couple of dollars for it. Yeah. Oh, a um, a restaurateur at that point, uh, before the game, said, "I'll give five thousand dollars to anybody," and that was a lot, a lot of, money of money in '61. That, that, sure like, was. Well, that was like that was probably more than a, a, a year's salary. Oh, well, definitely, 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 sure. And he and he did, and he said, "You sure?" And he said, "Yeah, kid, you make the money." That was nicer, Roger Maris. Uh. He took the ball. He did sell it oh, he for $5,000, oh. and you know what? He got married to his lovely wife, Rosemary, and they were married very, very happily. He celebrated his 50th anniversary oh, at the stadium uh, you know, a few years back. And, you know, so it was, um, yeah, again, another beautiful moment, you know, that kind of ties. Another Yankee moment. Another Yankee moment. You know, and, that's, that, and again, that's a little bit of the beauty of uh, Yankee baseball. You probably heard me talking about it in my opening monologue. I did. But I think that diehard Yankee fans are very, very savvy. And I think that um, they're a little bit ahead of the game. And like sometimes when attendance is down, it's not necessarily, in my opinion, that attendance is down because they don't love the team. I think that there's a silent majority out there that gets frustrated when they don't see the game played properly. And if they see it and the Yankee management doesn't, it, it's tough. And sometimes, sometimes, you know what, it shows up in either attendance or, you know, viewership. Well, Roger Maris, first of all, was a class act. Yeah. And uh, secondly, um, you have to play baseball a certain way. Yeah. Baseball is um, American pastime, the American pastime. Right. So um, the game's not played properly. Uh, Yankee fans don't like it. New York fans are very savvy fans. Whatever, whatever sport they root for, they know what they're talking about. Yeah. You know? uh, so it, yes, I, I and really particularly Yankee fans, sure. You mentioned Ralph Terry. Ah, uh, yes. You know, had a good you know, career with the Yankees. Yes, he did. But it was amazing, just as you said, that in 1960, you know, he's, uh, you know, he throws that pitch where it was so, you know, uh, devastating to him. But he got his chance a little bit later on. He did. He and did. as a matter of fact, I think you had a, um, you know, a chance meeting with Ralph Terry, if you can. 
if you can, tell us about that because we're going to go over to uh, the next graphic and we have the uh, elevated train right behind Yankee uh, Stadium. When we were young, mm -hmm. 12, 13 years old, even 11 years old, uh, we would go to ball games mm -hmm. alone. Five or six of us would gather together on a train and mm -hmm. go there. Now, if you did that, your parents would be arrested. Okay, <laughs> they would true. be, yes. That's true. So we would go there and we would, uh, we would know where the Yankees came out at the end of the game, a certain door. So we would, um, uh, we would wait out there and get autographs. And we all got autographs and they came out. So a friend of mine and myself, we were going up, walking up on the elevated train, which uh, mm -hmm. whatever it is, yeah. right, where you get that view of Yankee Stadium yeah. when you oh. pull in, it's something there special it is. Right. And uh, who sits right across from us but Ralph Terry. You and you could meet a nicer person. We were sitting there, I'm gonna say six, seven stops. I don't know where we got off, of yeah. course. And uh, here we were talking back and forth. Now, I don't know if it was what the year was, if it was 61, 62, but it was around that time, you know? Yeah. Uh, we were just kids. And um, that year in 62, he got his uh, revenge. He got it in a, some way, um, in a tough way, uh, against the San Francisco Giants in the seventh game of the uh, World Series. So Ralph Terry's on the mound, and um, he has second and third, and there's two out. Now, um, Willie Mays had hit a double, I believe, down the right field line, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, I, I think one of the Alus might have been on, on the base, and he was held up at third base. Roger Maris made a spectacular play, a great play at the plate. Who knows if he was safe or out? Mm -hmm. So who's up now, second and third? Here I am sitting there, and I'm 14 <laughs> oh. years old, and I'm saying, please, oh. and Willie McCovey is up. Oh. And Ralph Terry throws his infamous curveball again. Well, one second, before you even go there, uh, Second and third, first base is open. Right-handed pitcher to a left. Could you imagine uh, talk radio with that? Oh, Although boy. Cepeda was on deck and he was no walk in the park. Uh, then you have the loaded bases. Who knows? You exactly. walk somebody in, right? So okay, so you're on the edge it's of your seat. Fifty-fifty. Fifty-fifty. Okay. Pick your poison, right? That's right. So all of a sudden, I'm watching the TV, and uh, he throws the pitch, and all of a sudden, you could hear the the crack of the bat, and I said, oh, oh boy. And a second later, you see Bobby Richardson on a knee almost with the ball in his glove. And Bobby Richardson said that was the hardest ball that he ever caught in his entire life. And he's a wow. minister, so he's not going to lie. He's not going to no, lie. That no, ball he's almost, not. That no, ball almost not. took no. him to the outfield. That's right. right. We've that's seen right. that. Uh, so we so, won wow. 62. And uh, then um, 63 and 64 didn't go the way, it, right. you know, the way we planned it. But you run into Koufax and Drysdale, things could go awry. Look at that. Look you at know, that. For huh? You know, for batting practice and... Boy, that, go ahead. Tom. And that uh, Nicky Mantle hit, hit a ball right on top of that facade right there. Now, were you listening or watching? Watching or? on TV. You, well, you saw that. Yeah, oh, I did. And, and, I, and they, have a, they have a picture of it. Um, it's in the news on the front page where it hits, I believe it might even hit the lights, which kept it from going out of the stadium. Wow. They said something like 18 inches from, from going out, out of the stadium or something. Yeah. But it was, a, it was quite, a, uh, quite a rocket that he... Uh, they say that the ball was on, the trajectory was on its way up. Oh, Is that true? Uh, that's, I guess so. Uh, you know, I'm not a scientist, but boy. It was, uh, it was, it was un launched. Unbelievable. There unbelievable. was no, no question about that. So, all right, so that, uh, that day where I had that, the graphic up, that was not the, um, the game that you, that you were not at the game when you hit the home run. You were watching on, watch TV, on TV. But you were at another game. So, and um, yes. there we go. And I mean, it's a typical situation where he's, you know, he's, uh, changing, he's going to be leaving the stadium, and you have an idea with your friend. You say, "I do, Go ahead. I do." Um, <laughs> well, they're playing the Detroit Tigers, and okay. they could never beat the Detroit Tigers. Okay. There's always Frank Larry and Al Kaline, uh, you know, beating them somehow, how or another. Mm -hmm. uh, I said to my friend, "I said, um, listen, I know where they come out of. I remember from when I was a kid, they come out of this particular door in the back of the stadium." So I said, and, and they took Mickey Mantle out of the game because uh, they were losing the game by a certain amount of runs. Mm -hmm. And I believe they put Jack Reed, they used to call him Mickey Mantle's legs, okay? Okay. And um, so we run out there, my friend uh, is my age, and uh, he's a Mickey Mantle freak also. And we run around, we're going outside, and we run around the whole ballpark, and I find the door, I said, well, that's it. So my friend says, Mickey Mantle's not gonna come out of that door. I says, well, let's see. So we're standing there together, and who comes out of the door? dressed in slacks and a, uh, a golf shirt, a band lawn shirt, Mickey Mantle. And oh he's just God. standing 20 feet away from us. And we're both agog. We're just our mouths <laughs> are, uh, are wide open. 
So I have a program in my hand and a pen or a pencil. And my friend has given me a nudge. He goes, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. And I say, oh. So I walk over to Mickey Mantle and I say, Mr. Mantle, may I have your autograph? And the Mick, maybe he was having a bad day, maybe he was in pain. He said, uh, get out of here with that blank. blank. So I said, oh. So now I'm 17. I'm a tough Brooklyn kid, I think. You know what I mean? Again, I go home. I'm Devastated. Uh, sure. I really am. And I'm 17 years old, so yeah. it's a little embarrassing to say, but yeah. you know no. what I mean? Because this was, this was a, a demigod to, uh, to myself and to, to many other people. Mike Francesa is a big uh, yeah. Mickey Mantle uh, right. man. Yeah, yeah, so. Absolutely. And he was so humble, yeah. and he played with such courage and such guts. Yeah. And they have a, a picture in the paper uh, of Mickey Mantle mummified with all the tape. Oh, you wouldn't have I, a, you know, uh, I think we might. I think really, we have a picture really. um, uh, in the control room. We have a picture of Mantle with, uh, wrapping himself. Guys, if you get a, a chance uh, with Mantle with the um, taping himself before the game with all of the uh, wrapping going around his knees and, and, and all of that. Yeah, well, I had one from the Daily News, okay. which had his whole body uh, taped. And I think it had a slit here where you could see out. <laughs> and it said up there, what price glory? Ah. So what would he do for, for glory? But he was a hard-nosed uh, player who had a lot of courage to play uh, with the injuries that he had and a real leader on the team. The players always talk so highly of Mickey Mantle. Uh, <laughs> no. And um, yeah. uh, it was, it, it's just uh, something special. I also had a little clipping from a magazine I read. And it was uh, Al Kaline, who was a class act also. And he was, um, he was playing, a, he was a right fielder for the... Um, Detroit Tigers, and uh, he was giving out autographs, signing something in a department store. So some little kid goes up to him in Detroit and says, you're not half as good as Mickey Mantle. And he says, well, kid, nobody's half as good as Mickey Mantle. Uh, well, I cherish a, that. Yeah. You know, I, I was yeah. easy. Uh, yeah. And so I had those two clippings in my wallet, in a little wallet that mm -hmm. I had as a kid. Yeah. Uh, I, I was a young man at the time now, and uh, I kept them for, for years. Well, for I years. have to ask you a question. You idolize Mantle. You actually get to meet him. And he lets you down. He says, get that blank out of here. And it's crushing. And it would crush anybody. It would crush me. It would crush anybody. Did you, how did, you know, how did that affect you in terms of, did you, you know, uh, 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 your, you know, uh, how you perceived him going forward? Well, did you not like him anymore? Well, momentarily I was uh, extremely disappointed. But... He was a person who had many injuries. Uh, I think he had uh, some issues off the field also. Yeah, he right. liked to bend the elbow, is yes, that the, okay. is that the right, word? Right, right, right. Yep. So I said, uh, okay. and um, he played so hard, and um, he was such a great player. So I kept those things in, in my wallet, and uh, I actually took them further into my life. Mm. Uh, you know, I kept them all the time, you know. And well, you know what? As, as a matter of fact, we're going to uh, we'll go to uh, to our next graphic, and we have a, a picture of a very handsome U.S. Marine from 1967. Well, who could that Donald be? Donald Ritter, that uh, was you. Look at that. Man, that is, a, <laughs> that is a handsome young man right I there. I wish I was uh, 19 again. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so, wow. I mean, you joined the Marines. I did. I joined the Marine Corps in 1967. Okay. Yes. And um, I spent time in boot camp, in Fiji training, uh, came home on leave, and went back uh, to Pendle, Camp Pendleton, California, and then to Okinawa, and then uh, uh, as an infantryman in the United States Marine Corps, I served in Vietnam. And as uh, for, uh, fortune would, uh, would have it... As, uh, as things went, the Tet Offensive broke out, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, as an infantryman in the Marine Corps, we were you know, in a firefight one day, and uh, I happened to get shot uh, through and through my left back. And... Uh, I was saved by a, a very brave man that day, a, 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 someone named uh, uh, George Reardon, a corpsman, who was killed saving my life. So um, I was wounded, I was medevaced, and the medevac uh, wound up in Japan. And a, an interesting story is I'm in bed, uh, pretty banged up, and the guy next to me is pretty banged up, another Marine. and. Um, we're talking, and he says he's from Oklahoma, and I said, I'm a Yankee fan. He said, he's a Yankee fan. I said, yeah, yeah, Yankee fan, huh? So I reach in my wallet. You know, I picked it out of the drawer I had, uh, and uh, I showed him these two clippings. Well, he almost fell out of bed because he lived in Oklahoma as a young man, and he used to see Mickey Mantle uh, often. You know, he lived in the area. He would, 
Mickey Mantle would drive by in a convertible and such like that. He would wave to people and such like that. So he was a Mickey Mantle fan also and looked up to him as, you know, as this demigod that I did. And uh, it was very interesting, uh, the both of us, because uh, he was shocked. He was said, oh, wow, Mickey Mantle, you know, and, and it was a nice little conversation we had. It was a nice moment. That I still had those clippings, even though Mr. Mantle um, <laughs> preferred not to give me his autograph. <laughs> But uh, it was it was um, it was it was fun. It was something to remember. Yes. You know that's that's an that's an amazing story, and that's the connection. It almost feels like you know what do you say? Sure, you know, it's a, sure. You know, it's, it is. It's it is. A, there's some people they say oh, you know Red Sox nation, but it's a Yankee universe. No. You could be no. in the uh, Yankees. Are you could be in Japan, and you you know right. again right. when it comes to that uh, that logo, number that seven too, and that right the lucky that, seven. That story that you just told yes. that's that is uh, it was, really really it was endearing story. to me. What happened? Yes, I, yeah. I think about it. You know, I say. Hey, when I think about Mickey Mantle and such like that, the New York Yankees, yeah. it, it's a special organization. It really is. It's a class organization. It's, it's, it's iconic. It's something special in sports. And you know, you have uh, baseball in your DNA. You played it as a young boy, and you know, as you um, got older, you coached, and it was very rewarding to you. That's you right. were the manager, and tell us about that. Well, we. Um, uh, I was asked by the uh, AD of uh, New York High School where I subbed, and. Uh, by the uh, coach if I'd like to coach the JV. So we, uh, I said yes. And the uh, gentleman on uh, our left, uh, probably the viewer's left, in the yellow shirt is uh, Jim Leonard, who, was, uh, who the kids loved, who was a class act, and who is now the uh, chief of department in um, the New York City Fire Department. And he's the highest uh, uniform member, and he's right under the commissioner. Hopefully someday uh, they're good to him and give him a commissionership because he is a class act wow. and was a great coach. He was great. And that year we won the PSL championship on Staten Island for the JV. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. And um, it was very rewarding. It was very rewarding. Uh, I think there, you know, there was a plaque that went along with it. It's a little mod, but uh, yes, and it, it, I still have it. It means so much to me. Mm -hmm. um, and the kids' names are on it. And uh, I see the kids, and I saw uh, one of the boys this morning. He yelled out to my honest. Uh, his name is Andrew Myra, who's a uh, college referee in basketball. Oh wow! And a teacher. And uh, he gave me a big hello, Mr. Ritter, today as he drove up on uh, Guyana Avenue. So it was very, it's very nice. It's been very rewarding. Uh, I see them sometimes, and it's hello, Mr. Ritter, how you doing? Uh, and they, they, they say to me, when they talk to me, they say, yes, sir. They always say, sir, because oh. we used to run around the Newdorf track, and I would have a, a saying, honor, dignity, integrity, teamwork. And yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. And uh, they would kept repeating that and repeating that and repeating that. Teachers would come to me and say, Mr. Ritter, your boys are saying yes, sir, and yes, ma'am. And How did you do that? I said, well, <laughs> I threatened them. No, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no but they, uh, they were a great bunch of kids. I was, I was blessed to, you know, to, to coach these kids. They were doing me a favor by letting me coach them. That's how I felt about wow. them. They, yeah. were, they were great. They were too terrific. humble. You're too humble because nah. you, had, you had some impact Don't. on them, not only winning the championship, but teaching them, you know, uh, well, some character. important lessons. Character, character is the right. deal. That's, that's, that's the whole deal. That's, that's, that's high beautiful. school. It's JV ball. We're not. And, but when you win, you look a little better. The next year, you take the team. You go down to Florida. Uh, Bucky Dent uh, training camp. Tell us about that, if you That's can. That's uh, Buck, Bucky Dent School of Baseball. It's in Delray, or was. I don't know if it still exists, in Delray, Florida. Mm -hmm. And they had a, um, a replica of uh, Fenway Park. Fenway Park, yeah. Yeah, but not, not the stands, of course. No, I got you. Like, but they had the wall, the bullpens, the whole thing. Yeah. And uh, as you saw in the picture, yeah. uh, it was really exciting. The field was beautiful, manicured beautifully. And it was a great time, a great experience for the kids to travel together on a plane and go down there. And it made us closer. And it was a, it was a great experience for the kids and for myself. It really had to be. And, you know, I noticed on the, um, on the scoreboard, on the Fenway scoreboard, it had the, it had the, the three where the, uh, the he hit Bucky the three Dent. with Bucky Dent when he hit that, that three right. run homer. That's right. And, That's um, right. That's right. Uh, in 78, we can never, you know, forget that, the way that culminated the season, the comeback of all no. comebacks. And it was, uh, and, and again. The, and the funny thing, I believe uh, the Red Sox had at least first and second or second third with Carl Yastrzemski up. You're right. And, and he fouled out the third base. Dead medals and all. Oh, and he hugged that ball, boy, I'll tell you. Yep. You have great recall. Uh, I, I can't. You really remember. I, 
I can't. I can't forget these. Sometimes things. it's funny. I don't remember what I ate for breakfast, but we could remember oh, something that happened yes, in the yes, '70s yes, yes. or in '60s, or sure. in your case, even further back. By the way, you look way too young to have a, a you know a remembrance from 1953. So you look fantastic. Uh, that's you very still, kind you of you. Kept yourself in that's great shape, and, and all of these things that you were preaching to with your players, you know, as a coach, you you know, being a Marine, and then also uh, always being uh, you know uh, athletic. It's, it, you know, it, served you, it certainly served you well because you look, speak, and act very youthful. Thank um, you very much. I'm going to ask you a question, if we can, if just to circle back to, uh, to Mickey Mantle and just to kind of bring the old in with the new and what we were talking about before. Last year, in uh, 2016, the Yankees had a bobblehead night, and it was the uh, Triple Crown bobblehead night. And it was... 1956, it was. Yeah. So and it, it was 52, 130, and 353. Yeah, well, you know what? We weren't, we didn't get, you know, we didn't get a chance to go to that stadium, right? But, uh, you know, that would have been a nice um, collectible to have. And what I was reading was that a lot of diehard Yankee fans, in fact, uh, in the New York Post, uh, you could leave that graphic up, but in, I just want to read from um, Kevin Kernan from the New York Post back then. He wrote that sometimes it's good to be reminded about Yankees history, even for the Yankees. And he said that my dad was such a team player, Mickey, uh, Mickey Mantle's son said, all he wanted to do was win. That's he right. hated to lose. And Friday night, and they're talking about uh, the night of the bobblehead, uh, it was Mickey Mantle triple crown bobblehead night, and Yankee Stadium was packed because of it. 44,808 fans. In 1956, 60 years ago, Mantle, who was only 24 years old. Wow, imagine that. Imagine that. Won the Triple Crown, hitting 52 home runs, driving in 130 runs, and batting 353. The Yankees won the World Series that year, the middle of an amazing run from 47 through 62 when they won 10 World Series. Imagine that. Wow. Can you believe that? You know, wow. It is amazing, and it got me to thinking about something that I said in my monologue, and I want to get uh, you to weigh in on it. Um, here's an interesting stat about the Triple Crown season that a lot of people uh, don't know. Uh, to win the Triple Crown, obviously, you have to win the batting title. Exactly. He hit 353. Ted Williams hit 345, but he batted... Uh, he bunted 20 times Mickey Mantle and beat him out 12 times. Ted Williams was not a bunter. No, he was not. If you take the bunts out of the equation, Ted Williams has a 345 batting average. Mickey Mantle has a 343 batting average. Doesn't win the Triple Crown. But he gets those extra points because of the bunting. And when they asked him, Donald, they said, did you bunt to win batting title? He goes, no. He goes, what are you kidding me? Because first of all, some people were saying, Mickey, why are you bunting? You know, because I was also going for the home run crowd. You know, he's chasing uh, Babe Ruth with 60 home runs and everything like that. He said, the only time I bunted was to start a rally when my team was losing or we were trying to protect the lead to win a ball game. And how, I mean, how teamwork. We, how, School teamwork. And, and my question, sure. I don't know if you heard me say, Chase Headley, last year, He's up in the ninth inning, down seven to nothing against a shift. There's nobody on that side of the field. It's not like Mickey, where he's you know he's trying to bunt in. This guy's there. There's, I don't recall that. You know, I thought, but do you recall Mantle oh, as a? You, Mantle I recall as a bunt him bunting. You know, many times, and sometimes he would bunt with one hand, one arm. Okay. His forearms were so big. He said he had a groove in his forearm, a mus two, two muscle. Okay. And he would kind of lock the lock bat. Lock it in there. Yes. Wow. And just drag the. And he was very fast. In fact, in high school, one of his nick his nicknames was the Comus Comet, because okay. he came. He was born in Comus, Oklahoma, okay. and uh, he was fast. At one time, he was timed as the fastest uh, baseball player of first base. And these were bad knees. So, uh, but he he bunted, and he and and he was a total team player. On the field and in the, in the dugout and in the clubhouse. They loved him. The players loved him. He would help everyone out. 
And I mean, if Mickey Mantle could do it, how could these guys, you know, a guy like Mark Teixeira, and I've said this so many times, I think he absolutely ruined his career. Surely. For one reason, because of that shift and, and being, you know, here's one, he's, he's working on it, that's, that's, uh, right. that's pregame, that looks like batting practice. That's right. How many and guys it, do you see bunt in, no. in batting practice? And look at this, absolutely Donald, not. look at that, he's got a crowd, he's, he's working right. with them, he's teaching that's them. Right. And he's explaining when he was an excellent bunter. Oh. When, you, when you look at a guy, and this goes back to my, my monologue comments, when you look at a guy like Mark Teixeira, I believe he, he destroyed a, a Hall of Fame career because in 2009, they won the World Series his first year with us. Right. He batted 292. Right. He was a lifetime 300 hitter. It almost sounds impossible to believe, Donald, but he was a 300 hitter before he came to us. 2009, they win the World Series. Joe Madden was the only one that was shifting, okay, at that, that time. Year. The next year, everybody shifts on Teixeira, and I'm saying, please, just put a bunt down once in a while right. to get that to get that extreme shift or off. Or take of you. one of those inside pitches the other way. You can Even better, out the ball, yeah, because you're not going to always bunt. But uh, Joe Madden didn't develop the shift. That was shift was used on Ted Williams, right? Okay, so he brought it back, and it, and if you're a left-handed hitter and you don't uh, try to go the other way and you hit into that shift, it's 20, 30 points off your batting average, and your team's going to lose games because you're not going to be on base to score runs. So they have to discipline themselves. They can't complain about the shift. They were talking about, well, let's make it illegal to shift. Yeah. Uh, uh, no. But if they get it's, to that point, then, you know, then that that's would be one thing. But you play within the rules. That's you right. know, Donald, we have one more graphic left, and it's okay. the most important graphic oh, in wow. my opinion what is that if we can uh you were a, again. no <laughs> you were an fdny captain and that was your last day uh, on the job tell us about that if you will well um that was 2002 one year after the events of 2001 on september 11th and my wife and i nancy we um for five years every september 11th we would trek by uh by um train to the ferry and the ferry and we would walk to uh, the 9-11 and um, to the towers, uh, and we would listen to names be read off, and then we would walk up to St. Paul's Church where they had posters and flowers um, uh, set up, and we'd go say a prayer. Then we'd walk to Canal Street. She would shop, buy some knockoffs, and uh, <laughs> we would go to Little Italy, and we had a restaurant we would go to there. Yeah. And then we would walk back, and then we would stop at 9-11 again and say a little prayer, bow our head, and we did that for five years. After five years, it got to be a little much. Uh, you know, we said, okay, we, we did what we thought was appropriate. And, um, and it, that was it. And we stopped going there. And uh, it was, it's, the memories of 9-11 are, are a, little, uh, a little severe and you know, very tragic, of course. Yeah. Right. And so with... Uh, with I was there that day it occurred. You were there yes, that day. Yes, right. I was, yes. And Not when the, both buildings came down, but when Building 7 came down and most of the day, about 30 hours straight. Uh, right. from about 12 o'clock in the afternoon to uh, whatever, 11 o'clock in the uh, morning till the next morning, past and, the next morning. And as a captain, the decisions that, that uh, need to be made and, and things and just the absolute heartbreak of uh, knowing. And I, I, I truly feel that uh, in, in our country's history, I don't think there was any prouder moment than FDNY and the way they handled their brothers and the way they dug uh, on that pile. Uh, I, I think that is something... 343 uh, firefighters died that day. And I wear a medal that has 343 on it. Uh, FDNY is a great organization, and just the men, the courage that day is just unspeakable. You know, Donald, so many people make the mistake, they look to Washington to solve all their problems. I remember you guys. Digging on the pot. You didn't even want, you didn't want any federal assistance. You said, no one's touching this site. It's we, sacred. It's sacred. sacred. We will handle that. I mean, wow. We Donald, had, I mean, we had buckets. Unbelievable. Buckets. Yeah. We'd taken it by a hand. Right. Because you couldn't dig. You might hit a body. You wouldn't allow it. Right. right. You wouldn't allow anyone no, to treat no. that, that sacred ground any we other way. We almost came to fisticuffs with the police department because word. they were ordered by their commission. To, so, to, yeah, things, right. things got a little ugly, but we straightened them out. And right. the, uh, uh, the uh, NYPD is a great organization also, mm -hmm. of course, and they lost 25 uh, of their brothers. So it was, um, it was a tough day, it was a tough time, but the country rebounded, and, uh, and that's the way we are. We're Americans. So. And you know, when rebounded, and as you said, one thing that I felt so uh, heartwarming was the fact that 
uh, baseball was part of that where, where Piazza hits that home run. Big and, home and the run. Yankees make that run in, in 2001. And to they, the only thing that came short, game yeah. seven, they lose yeah. in game seven. Because I wanted that parade up Broadway I so know. bad just to kind of shove it in the face of those, um, yeah. those uh, evil people that yeah. did that. Right. Well, Donald, it was an absolute pleasure having you down here. And it was a pleasure talking to you as a diehard Yankee fan and for us to, to share our uh, thoughts and um, opinions of, of, of the Yankees, past and present. But more importantly, you know, I would just, to just like to say it was an honor speaking to you because too many times in sports the word hero is thrown around too loosely, and we understand why. Sure, there is sure. a degree of heroics to it. It's when a it's, metaphor. It's, it's yes. mano right. mano, and, right. and there is a degree. But you know what? You were in the, uh, uh, you were wounded during the Tet Offensive, and for those of our uh, fans out there that are too young to know, uh, that was probably the biggest battle or attack of the entire Vietnam War. It you was. were there for that. You were there for 2000. And one, one, you served your city, you served your country so admirably. And I would just like to say thank you for all of your sacrifice. And it's been a, a lifetime of good deeds and good work. So it was an honor speaking to you, Donald Ritter. And I want to thank you for taking a couple of minutes and coming on our show tonight. I thank you. And it was an honor to be with you, uh, Michael. Thank you.